one. There were three of them, three girls. They were standing side by side. They were standing at attention. And then the girl in the pink dress, the one who was standing right next to Ramey, let out a sob and said, the more I think about it, the more terrified I am. I'm too terrified to go on. The girl clutched her baton to her chest and dropped to her knees. Ramey stared at her in wonder and admiration. She herself often felt too terrified to go on, but she had never admitted it out loud. The girl in the pink dress moaned and toppled over sideways. Her eyes fluttered closed. She was silent. And then she opened her eyes very wide and shouted, Archie, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I betrayed you. She closed her eyes again. Her mouth fell open. Ramey had never seen or heard anything like it. I'm sorry, Ramey whispered, I betrayed you. For some reason, the words seemed worth repeating. Stop this nonsense immediately, said Ida Nee. Ida Nee was the baton twirling instructor, and even though she was old, over 50 at least, her <laughs> hair was an extremely bright yellow. She wore white boots that came all the way up to her knees. I'm not kidding, said Ida Nee. Ramey believed her. Ida Nee didn't seem like much of a kidder. What made me come up with Ramey Nightingale? When, um, so I served for two years as the national ambassador for young people's literature, which was great. I got to travel all over the country talking about the importance of reading and reading together and how that connects us. And um, as part of that, I had a kind of a PowerPoint that I would do when I go into schools to talk to kids. And in that PowerPoint, I talk about myself as a kid and how I became a writer. And there's a slide in um, that PowerPoint that has a picture of me and my mother and my brother. And I, I uh, flashed that uh, slide up there and I asked the kids, who's missing in this picture? And they, they say, your dad. And I stood up in front of so many kids and told them the truth about this thing about my dad leaving that Ramey Nightingale, which is basically, that's what Ramey is dealing with, I think that that's where this book came from, was just standing up there saying it again and again and again, and then the truth ended up in the book. How do I decide on all the characters' names? That, that, everything about writing is hard for me. I struggle with almost every part of it, except for naming characters. The, the names pop into my head. And, um, and that's another reason I always have that notebook with me. And I don't know where the names come from, so just talking to the librarian here before I came on, and was it the realtor who was named Ramey? Where, where are you, Mira? The, yeah, the appraiser. And, it, and it's like, oh no, I wonder if I stole her name. I don't know where I got the name Ramey. It just popped into my head. So tell her I said, hey, and um, <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness, can I twirl a baton? Um, I cannot twirl a baton. I did take baton twirling lessons. Um, <clears throat> I would say right up until like maybe I was 15, if somebody said move left, I would have to stand and think about what that meant. Um, left, left, left. So to move left and to twirl something at the same time, out of the question, you know? And so it, I just never learned. And this is the funny thing is when you get to be an adult, you're, you're put in situation, you're not put in a situation where you don't know how to do something very often. And right before this book came out, I went and talked to Southern booksellers and uh, there was a baton twirling bookseller who was my age, and we were up on stage, and she had brought a baton, and she kept on saying to me, you can do this, and I could feel this sweat trickling down <laughs> the side of my shirt, and I kept on saying, I can't, and she said, it's simple, it's simple, you just, and I couldn't do it, so I, yeah, I, how many of y'all can twirl a baton? Yeah, you're better than me, that's all I can say. If I could be any of my characters, who would, who would I be and why? Yeah, you know, that's a really, really good question. Uh, and I don't have an easy answer for it. You know, the first book um, was because of when Dixie, which was told in first person. And when you write a book in first person, people always assume that you are that person. And so I went around a lot explaining that I was not Opal, that Opal is a much kinder, wiser, braver kid than I ever was. Um, so in a way, I think that I would like to be Opal, maybe. And also, I always think of Winn-Dixie as like the, that was like everything that's happened to me as a writer 
has happened because of Winn-Dixie. So the question is, so I write two pages a day, and I actually think my official biography, which is alarming that there's an official biography, says two pages a day, five days a week, which is slightly erroneous because when I'm traveling, I don't write at all, and when I'm home, it, uh, I, I write every day of the week. I just do two pages of, uh, at a time. Does that mean, as you said, that I am writing a novel? Yes, yes. When I get back home after this trip, I will be working on a novel. Because the world just makes more sense to me if I'm working on a story. How many journals have I gone through with all of my ideas? I save the journals. I save them. I, I, I think that they should probably be burned when I die because they make me look like they're, I'm crazy. But I save them and I, and I mark the dates that I use them on the outside and I will go back. It makes it easier to go back and find things. I, at this point, I have 25 of them all arranged. Yeah. So that's a great question. It's like I've never been asked that question before. How did I come up with the idea for Edward Tulane? So um, I have a friend who um, gave me a rabbit doll for a Christmas gift. And uh, he's big. He comes up to about here on me, and he's dressed in a very elegant outfit. And when she handed him to me, I said, thank you very much. What's his name? And she said, Edward. And so I took this gigantic China rabbit doll. He's actually not China. He's melamine, but that doesn't sound as good. Um, and I put him on the couch in my living room, and every time I walked into the living room, I screamed because he's a really creepy-looking rabbit, and he's just sitting in there like that. And then, like, the third night that I had him in the house, I think he had worked his way into my subconscious. I had a dream about him. And he was underwater, face down on the ocean floor, and he had no clothing on. It's your basic naked rabbit dream. And I think all writers have naked rabbit dreams, and I'm just brave enough to stand up here and talk about them. So I thought that would be a great way to, to that would be a good picture book is what I thought. So I started with that image, and then everything just unfolded. I didn't, it was the easiest book I ever wrote. So I always call Tiger Rising my shy child because, you know, first came because of Winn-Dixie, then Tiger Rising, and then Tale of Despero. So it's like two baton twirling overachievers and then this quiet little book in between. And um, that book came to me because I had written a short story where Rob, the main character, had showed up as a secondary character. And when I finished that story, Rob didn't go away, and he literally kind of like followed me around, another thing that makes me sound slightly crazy, like the naked rabbit dreams. But I knew that the character wanted something, and I didn't know what it was. And then uh, my mom, uh, I was in Minnesota, my mom was still here in Florida, and she called me one day and told me that a tiger had escaped from the zoo. Um, and I thought, that's what that boy is waiting for, is a tiger. And I hung up on my mother, and I... <laughs> Would, and I started to write. Am I going to write a sequel to Because of Winn-Dixie? Well, I have gotten that question a lot, and the, 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 the most um, exhaustive way I got that question was kind of at the very beginning. This is a boy in Illinois who would be grown up by now, and he wrote me like literally like a 15-page letter that said, this is what's going to happen, and because of Winn-Dixie 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, he outlined everything. And then at the very end of the letter on the last page, he squeezed in a P.S. I have done all the hard work. Get busy. <laughs> and I, I carried that letter around with me for a couple moves, and I ultimately lost it. Um, I don't think that there will be a sequel to Because of Winn-Dixie because I feel like Opal is in a safe place. Um, as she's seen and loved, and she has a family, and so I, I don't think that there will be a sequel. How do I organize a story? Do I outline? Do I have a, a multiple journals? I don't outline. I can't outline. If I outline a story, I will not, I will not write the story. So I never know what's going to happen in a story. It's one of the reasons Despero was so hard, because it was very plot heavy, and I had no idea how it was all going to come together. It's a relatively terrifying way to write. Um, but I have found this about writing. There's no right way to do it, and I got into a big knockdown drag out in a school gymnasium once with a uh, kid who raised his hand and said, that's the way I write. I can't do it um, without, you know, I can't do it with an outline, and my teacher insists that I have to have an outline, and I'm like, is your teacher here? 
And um, he said, yeah, she's sitting there right there. And I had to turn and go, I don't think you should make him do an outline. And yeah, because it's different for everybody. And, and writing is one of those things where um, you, it's, it is a personal journey. You figure it out by writing and by reading and by reading what you've written to people who will give you positive feedback and not make fun of you. Do I really only write two pages? What if things are going great? Do I stop? I do. There's a great quote from Hemingway about I'm going to be nice to the me, the writer who's going to exist tomorrow. So it'll be that much easier to come in the next morning because every morning I think, I can't do this. I don't want to do this. And, and then I, that's, I've learned to do it right away. So I, the coffee maker is set for 5.30. I, I get up, I pour the coffee, I go in there and write. I, I think that most of us have a voice in our head that says, um, you can't do this, what do you think you're doing, this will never work out. I have found out for me personally, that voice sleeps in until about nine o'clock. <laughs> so if I get up at 5.30, um, it shows up and it's got all of its, its like friendly things to say to me, but I'm already, I've already done the important work for the day. So that, and that's another thing to figure out as you write. What's the best time? When does that voice that says, don't do it, go away? Why are there so many animals in my books? It's a really hard question for me to answer. I thought for a while that I, when I was a kid that I wanted to be a vet. I love animals. Uh, there was an ugly incident involving a German shepherd and a detached eyeball that convinced me I'm not up for that, you know? Um, <clears throat> so that love of animals might be one reason. Um, but it's also like when an animal is in a book, I think as readers, we tend to let our guard down a little bit more easily, and we trust, and so then we're into the story more. And it's odd that I do it because um, when I was a kid, I read Black Beauty, and from that point on, I would not read a book with an animal on the cover because I was so torn up by what had happened to that horse that, so I, I, every week I would look at uh, Charlotte's Web in the spin rack at the library and think, no, 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 not me. <laughs> because that pig looks so worried on the cover of that book, you know. And the irony is the kid me would not read one book that I have written because they all have animals on the cover, yeah. The Ramey doesn't. No, ramy has got a bird somewhere on there, I think. So I've had uh, two of my books um, turned into movies, and the question is, am I very protective of my characters when Hollywood comes knocking on my door? You have one way to control what happens to your book in Hollywood, and that is whether or not you sell the rights to the book. And as soon as you sell the rights to the book, it is theirs to make into a movie. And so it depends on who makes it. So um, sometimes they want you to work with them. When I worked, uh, I worked uh, very closely with Wayne Wang, who did Because of Win Dixie. I learned how to write a screenplay. It was super exciting. I got to go to the set. When they made Tale of Despero, I would see sketches occasionally. I was looped in, but it was like this beautiful dream that they constructed without me. Um, but it, it's, it is a translation of my book. And my books have been translated into almost 50 languages now. And I can't read those languages. And so I think it's really s like it would be small of me to say, no, don't go out into the world. Don't, don't go into a language that I don't understand. Don't go out and become a movie because it's like, it's like your kid growing up. You let it go out into the world and hope that things go well. Also, movies are great advertisements for books, I have to say. <laughs> I think, yeah, so what made me think of writing Mercy Watson? So uh, how many of y'all know Mercy Watson, the, the pig who eats toast? When you, when, you write, when you write books for kids, people always say, what lesson did you mean to impart here? And I don't know if you get this question when you write for adults, but for kids. And Mercy Watson is the answer to that question. Nobody learns anything in those books. She remains a pig. She does not change her ways. Everybody just... So where did the idea come from? I, I've learned to always carry a notebook with me because um, when I travel or even when I'm just out in the world, I'll see things. And... I didn't see anything, I just, this was in my own head. I saw a pig face and underneath it the word mercy. And I'm like, great. And I got out my notebook and I wrote that down. I thought it was very funny that a pig was gonna be named Mercy. And then I figured out that she lived with Mr. and Mrs. Watson and they weren't pigs and that seemed like it was funny to me too. And so I had what I thought was a good beginning and I kept on playing around with it and I could never quite make it work. I would take it out, put it away, come back to it and it just wasn't gelling. And then I got a brand new car. It was 
the first brand new car of my life. It was a Cooper Mini. It was before everybody had a Cooper Mini, so it was super exciting. And I was just beside myself, and I went to take the very first day of the new car, a friend to the airport. Are you with me on this? Okay. She got into the airport with, I mean, into the car with a gigantic piece of toast. And it was covered in butter. And she started to eat it in my brand new car, spraying greasy crumbs everywhere. And I said to her, it's my brand new car. Can you wait until you get to the airport to finish your toast? And instead of that stopping her, I got this long lecture about toast and how it tasted better if somebody else made it for you, how it should be buttered all the way to the edges, how it should have a great deal of butter. And by the time I got rid of her, I knew what was missing in the book about the pig, which is what the pig loved, which is toast with a great deal of butter. Am I going to write another Mercy Watson book? Things end on a very serious note, indeed. Uh, the pig who never learns anything. There is going to be another Mercy Watson book. Yeah, yeah. So that, that, I have to say that pig is just so much fun. Like you write a novel... And then I always feel like the pig is kind of like the sorbet in between the courses of a big heavy meal. So it's just like it cleanses my palate. It's so much fun to do. Okay, can I say something again? Thank you so much for being so present with me, for asking such great questions. I'm really grateful. And Orlando, you know, yeah. So thank you.